Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to Global Imno Talk 2023. My name is Kazuo Moro from Osaka University Graduate School of Medicine. And uh, we are very excited to uh, have Jennifer Meosberg today for the speaker. But uh, before I introduce her, um, I have two housekeeping announcements. Firstly, uh, please note that we won't get the uh, real-time question. So if you have a question, please um, make a question through the Twitter. I'm going to explain how to make a question after uh, Jenny's talk. And secondly, uh, next uh, uh, ne next week's speaker is um, Martin Parlick uh, from uh, Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center in USA. So uh, please uh, join us uh, again next week. And so now I'm very happy uh, and honored to introduce Jenny uh, Mielsberg. So Jenny uh, is a professor of tissue immunology at Karolinska Institute, Stockholm, Sweden, and also head of the um, clinical lung and allergy research unit at uh, Karolinska University Hospital. Uh, Jenny uh, defended her uh, PhD thesis in 2010, and during uh, the same year, she joined Professor uh, uh, Hagen Spitz, Spitz Lab. And uh, at the um, Academic Medical Center at Amsterdam, uh, Netherlands. And as a postdoctoral fellow in uh, Professor Spitz's lab, she uh, identified two novel uh, subset of human ILCs, innate lymphoid cells, uh, ILC1 and ILC2. So I personally remember uh, her paper very well because uh, it was like a year after uh, we identify um, ILC2 in the mice. And at the time, so many people asked me whether ILC2 uh, really exists in, even in the human. Uh, but her paper in Nature um, Immunology clearly showed that, uh, yes, ILC2 um, exists in the, uh, even in, in the human body. So um, since uh, 2013, Jenny has owned her uh, own lab at Karolinska Institute and has contributed to uh, develop uh, this novel field in immunology, uh, especially in the lung and um, gastrointestinal tract. And importantly, she provided the first uh, transcriptional um, characterization of human ILCs at the single cell level. And uh, this uh, finding uh, was uh, uncovering um, the previous unknown heterogeneity among uh, human ILCs and a regulatory mechanism that control the function of specific ILC um, subsets. And her contribution um, have uh, extended to our understanding of the role of ILCs uh, in GVHD, liver fibrosis, and uh, colorectal cancer, and also uh, inflammatory bowel disease. disease. Uh, the primary object of her lab is to gain insight into uh, how the tissue microenvironment um, regulate ILCs and how ILCs uh, can target it for the uh, therapy of IBD um, and asthma and cancer. So uh, now, uh, uh, Jenny, uh, if you're ready, could you please turn on your camera? Show up. Thank you. So hi, Jenny. Thank you very much uh, for this talk. Thank you so much for inviting me. Okay. And so uh, before your talk, uh, everybody's talk invited to this uh, seminar, uh, we make one question for the speaker. So the question I wanted to ask you is, what is a trait in your personality that uh, help you the most? Uh, in your scientific career. So could you please kind of kindly answer to this question? Yeah, it's a tricky question, but also an interesting question, I think, to reflect on. I think 
uh, one of the things, I mean, science, we, we all love science and we go to, to the lab and we enjoy what we do, but it can also really be super challenging at times, right? I mean, experiments don't work and we're getting ourselves into difficult topics, addressing major sort of human challenges regarding health and disease. So I think one of the things that I really benefit from is to be that I'm really an optimist by nature. And sometimes that can go a little bit too far. I really do think that the next experiment will work. And sometimes you try a little bit too hard, perhaps. But uh, and I think that also, you know, if it, I always tell my students that if it was easy, it would already have been done. Uh, so, you know, what we tend to do tends to be very, very difficult and and just firmly believing that if you try hard enough and, you know, we have everything needed to do this experiment you know why should we not succeed to do it so i, I think that sort of optimism ha has helped me a lot i think another thing which i think i have more acquired with time is that I, i've started to become a little bit more sort of pragmatic used to be i'm, I'm still a perfectionist but le i mean less so i think i've I, you know, we we are all sort of forced to to package our papers into coherent stories where we solve all problems, and that's not really how things work. So I think I've been become more pragmatic when it comes to realizing that it's important that we get our data out there, and we might not know everything, we might not understand everything about the experiments that we have done and and the the data, but you know, more pragmatic when it comes to actually getting our data out there, getting the publications out, which is also important for the students and the postdocs, of course. So I think this sort of optimism and uh, pragmatism, which is more an acquired feature than maybe a personal trait, um, has served me well uh, in my... Are there any way to like a train that uh, trait? Which one of them? <laughs> yeah, the first optimism yeah no that is a tricky one but i think it, it also comes with uh, sort of believing that you can do it you know i i think uh young people tend to and i of course we all have our self-doubts but just thinking that you know why wouldn't i be able to do it i see a lot of people around me that can do it and and you know i i should not be worse at, at things than, than others if i do a good job so um Exactly. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much for uh, sharing uh, your trade. So now uh, we want to uh, move to your talk. Uh, could you please mm -hmm. share your slide? And the title uh, of uh, Jenny's talk today is the role of innate lymphoid cell in good homeostasis and disease. So uh, once you become ready, please get started. Perfect. So. I hope you can see my slides well and that yes. they are green. Yeah, great. So great. I'm super honored to be invited to this seminar series. I've listened into several of these talks and they have been uh, really, really good. And uh, so it's it's great to, to be here. And I wanted to tell you about the work that we have done in the last few years on understanding the role for innate lymphoid cells or ILCs, particularly in gut homeostasis and uh, disease. And I, I think that the ILC family is really starting to become familiar to most immunologists now, um, sort of during the last 10 years or so. And we are starting to really realize that the ILCs are innate counterparts of uh, the T cell family, and that we have these innate sort of corresponding cell types. So NK cells being the innate mirror image of cytotoxic T lymphocytes. Uh, ILC1s to TH1 cells, ILC2s to TH2 cells, and ILC3s um, to TH17 and TH22 cells. And that these cells, just like T cells, then contribute both to homeostatic functions, but also can be dysregulated to participate in inflammation. And for the so-called group 1 ILCs, the NK cells and ILC1s, of course, the the sort of homeostatic functions and the uh, immune defense mechanisms of this lies in their capacity to help us combat intracellular microbe infections, but also tumors. But we also know that these cells can be uh, have an exaggerated function and then rather play a role in chronic inflammatory diseases, such as in the gut during IBD. And I will talk about the role for ILC1s in IBD in my talk. <clears throat> 
And then for ILC2s, we know that they are just like Th2 cells, important to help us combat parasite infections, but they can then get an exaggerated uh, activation and function and, and contribute to allergy and, and asthma. And then for the type three lymphocytes, they help us to, to handle extracellular microbes and, and help in barrier defense, not the least in the gut. And I will talk quite a bit about that uh, feature of these cells, um, but they can also then be um, wrongly activated and then rather contribute uh, to disease such as in psoriasis, for example. And we <clears throat> have studied these cells in the human setting and the subsetting, particularly of ILC3, is a little bit different in the human as compared to the mouse. Um, so in the human uh, setting, NKP44 is a relatively good marker for ILC3s that produce IL-22. It's not a perfect uh, marker, but it really enriches for cells that produce IL-22. And I will talk a lot about this marker, NKP44, and, and this subset of ILC3s. Whereas those cells that lack NKP44 are then uh, rather cells producing IL-17. <clears throat> so, of course, the, the important difference between ILCs and T-cells lies then in the way that these cells are activated. So ILCs lack rearranged antigen-specific uh, receptors, and they rather respond to the microenvironment uh, in terms of responding to cytokines, uh, lipid mediators, but also uh, ligand receptor uh, interactions that, that activates these cells. And that makes these cells, of course, very receptive to the environment. <clears throat> and that's probably also why we see this really great plasticity of these cells in the, in the way that they can adapt to the microenvironment. So, for example, ILC3s uh, can, under the influence of IL-1 beta and IL-12, take on the capacity to start making intron gamma and then uh, look like you know, sort of ILC1s. And vice versa, ILC1s can then, under the influence of IL-1 beta and IL-23, take on uh, functions of, of ILC3s. And I will talk quite a lot about this balance between ILC1s and ILC3s uh, in the intestine. And that makes, of course, the, the function for these cells in the role they play in different tissues quite uh, complex. And these cells, ILCs, are particularly enriched in mucosal surfaces. And the gut is one of these sites where we find relatively high frequencies of, of ILCs. And that has made us very interested in uh, assessing the role for ILCs in inflammatory bowel disease, where we have these two major diagnoses of, of uh, IBD, namely ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, which are both chronic inflammatory uh, diseases affecting the mucosa of the intestine. But ulcerative colitis is then more a continuous mucosal inflammation of the colon and the rectum. Whereas Crohn's disease uh, is more a patchy inflammation where you have uh, pieces of, of the intestine that, that is not inflamed. And it can also affect the entire GI tra tract and even uh, extra intestinal sites such as the, the skin, uh, etc. So that has, um, it is something that we are very interested in, in understanding the role of ILCs in these different diseases. And we're really starting to <clears throat> understand the role for ILCs in the intestine. And of course, a lot of this work comes from uh, mouse models of, of colitis or bacterial inf infection in the intestine. And there we have learned that ILC3s, or raw gamma T expressing ILC3s, are really an important source for IL-22 in the intestine and that IL-22 is important to keep barrier function. And that's because IL-22 acts on uh, epithelial cells and induces the production of antimicrobial peptides and mucins and, and chemokines. This really seems to be a conserved mechanism. We have also shown that IL-22 derived from ILC3, so using supernatants from human ILC3s, can also induce production of antimicrobial uh, peptide from, from human uh, intestinal epithelial cells such as S100 proteins and lipocalin and RAG1A, uh, to mention a few. And that this, just like in the mouse, is dependent on uh, STAT3 for, for, for this process to occur. So it really seems to be uh, a rather conserved mechanism. <clears throat> we have also learned from mouse models that there are other homeostatic functions for ILCs in the intestine. And this is work from uh, Greg, Greg Sonnenberg's group and also Matt Hepworth. 
that show that uh, MHE class two expressing ILCs um, are important for regulating commensal specific TH17 cells. And they do that because they cannot activate these cells, but rather induce apoptosis uh, of these cells. And more recently, we have also learned that these MHG class two expressing ILCs are important also for inducing a particular subset of regulatory T cells uh, co-expressing GORC and, and FOXP3. So this is really a way for, for MHG class two expressing ILCs to uh, mediate peripheral tolerance and, and a way to keep uh, gut homeostasis. And we have also done some work on these um, sort of uh, antigen presenting ILCs in the human setting, where we see that also in the human colon, uh, ILCs can express HLA-DR. So this is the sort of one of the human equivalents of class two molecules, of course. And just like in the mouse, we see that these cells do not express any co-stimulatory molecules, at least the ones that we have assessed. So CD86, CD80, and CD70. But in contrast to the mouse, we can quite easily uh, upregulate these molecules on the surface of ILC3s by stimulating ILC3s with um, interleukin-1 family members, so IL-1 beta and IL-18, which then induces uh, expression of CD86, CD80, and CD70. So we used, <clears throat> as we often do, we used human tonsils to try to um, sort of unravel the mechanisms for this in more detail. And it turned out that this is really mediated by NF-kappa B activation by these cytokines, which leads to upregulation of these uh, co-stimulatory molecules. And that together with the fact that ILC3s can take up and process and also present antigens on the surface of, of, of these cells can then induce recall responses in memory CD4 positive T cells. Now, clearly, this is not the case in, in the human, uh, in the gut, uh, where these cells lack co-stimulatory molecules. And we think that TGF-beta, which we know is an important homeostatic cytokine in the intestine, is probably uh, sort of dampening this because TGF-beta is very good at inhibiting the upregulation of these co-stimulatory molecules. So that's probably why we don't see any co-stimulatory molecule expression on these cells in the human intestine. But we do have these cells uh, in the human gut, we, but we still don't really know what the function for these cells are in the gut, if they in, in fact can activate uh, T cells or if they rather act like in the mouse to, to uh, induce sort of energy and, and uh, prevent the activation of these cells. But we know that other things happen to ILCs uh, during inflammation. So one of the things that we and others have observed is that uh, during inflammation in the gut, you get enrichment of interferon gamma producing ILCs. And that includes intraepithelial ILC1s uh, described by Colonna's group, but also uh, ILC1s, um, which then seem to be derived from ILC3s. And this plasticity is really regulated by myeloid derived factors such as IL-12 and IL-18, which then induces expression of, of TBET in these cells and makes these cells capable of producing uh, interferon gamma and then contributing to inflammation in the intestine. So TBET is an important transcription factor for these cells, but we have also shown that there is another transcription factor that really seems to be involved in this plasticity, and that's uh, Iolos, uh, and the, that's the name of the Greek uh, god of the winds, hence the, the picture here. And we know that this transcription factor Iolos is expressed in ILC1s, and we could also show then that if you transdifferentiate ILC3s into ILC1 cells of different types by stimulating ILC3s with IL12, you get upregulation of, of Iolos. But if you prevent this upregulation by uh, in also co-treating the cells with linalidomide, which is an anti-cancer drug and that specifically targets Iolos and a related transcription factor, Icaros, we can then prevent this transdifferentiation. Instead, you get uh, upregulation of GORC and Helios, um, which is known to be expressed by ILC3, so you get rather enhanced ILC3 uh, function. So we can also now add Iolos as another transcription factor that, that regulates the function and plasticity of, of these ILC1s. Now, recently, we have also added uh, another cell type to this uh, sort of puzzle when it comes to IBD, 
and that's these CD45RA positive ILCs that lack the epigenetic and transcriptional, metabolic, but also functional features of mature ILCs, but that have the capacity to differentiate both to ILC3 and to ILC1. And uh, they express the transcription factors TCF7 and also KLF2. And we call these cells naive ILCs or quiescent ILCs because they resemble in many ways naive T cells, which are also in a state of quiescence before they are primed and activated by their antigen and then polarized and differentiated to specialized uh, subsets. And these naive ILCs have been described before uh, by several groups. So first by uh, Jim DeSanto, and I believe he talked about these cells a few weeks ago in this seminar series. Um, and they've been have then been described as, as precursors of, of mature or differentiated ILCs uh, in the blood. But we also have descriptions of these cells in human tonsils and in human nasal polyps. Um, but these cells, we still don't really know how the differentiation capacity of these cells differ between different human tissues and also really how these cells relate to mature subsets of ILCs in the, in the human setting. So this is something that we have been very interested in uh, for many years now and that we um, have started to, to understand a little bit more about. So that's really the, the focus of the majority of my talk. I will, I will spend a lot of time on this. So this was work that was really led by Eftemia Pupino, who was a PhD student in my lab at the time. Now she's a postdoc at Johns Hopkins. Um, but we set out to, to really try to delineate uh, these more sort of naive or, or quiescent ILCs in the human tonsil uh, first. So what we did was that we zoomed in on ILCs expressing CD127, uh, which is sort of the you know, main marker for ILCs expressing uh, CD117 or CKIT, but lacking uh, CRTH2, which is the marker for ILC2s. Just to sort of really zoom in on, on these um, cells that we thought would contain these more immature ILCs. We also zoomed in on cells lacking the ILC3 marker NKP44, but also HLADR, because we know that HLADR is induced by IL1 beta and IL18 as a a potential sign of activation of these cells. So we uh, gated in on these HLADR negative and KP44 negative cells and then looked at the expression of CD45RA and CD62L, which we know are markers for naive uh, T cells. And we did this in tonsil and in blood to compare and looked at the distribution of the expression of these two markers in these two tissues and could see that the tonsil really is very different as compared to the the blood in terms of these markers, because we have a lot more 45RA expressing cells lacking CD62L as compared to the blood, where the majority of the cells expressing CD45RA also co-express CD62L. And this is, of course, also the way that it looks like for T cells in the blood. The tonsil ILCs are also different from the blood cells uh, in the sense that they express uh, more CD69, so indicating that they are more activated or potentially resident cells uh, in the tonsil. So we really had a lot of, of differences in tonsil versus blood. So we decided to look more closely into these tonsil subsets, looking both at the ones expressing CD45RA, uh, but also comparing them to those lacking CD45RA and also to mature subsets of ILCs. And we did this with bulk RNA-seq and could conclude that the cells expressing CD45RA, so the red and the blue uh, populations here, they really differ from each other. So they you know, transcriptionally are different from each other, but they also differ from the mature subsets of cells. We could also conclude that cells that lack 45RA, so these black uh, cells here, they really cluster in with the ILC3. So they uh, really uh, are ILC3s very likely, indicating that CD45RA is a good marker for cells that at least can be easily distinguished from uh, mature ILC populations. To learn more about these cells, we uh, turn to gene set enrichment analysis, uh, focusing in on um, metabolic pathways and could see that um, both of these two populations were really lacking um, transcript uh, transcriptional signs of glycolysis and fatty acid metabolism, which we know is active in more activated uh, T cells as they uh, become activated. 
but instead we could see enrichment of transcripts associated with oxidative phosphorylation for CD62L positive uh, cells, so the upper panel here. And oxidative phosphorylation is something that um, we see in naive T cells, really indicating that these cells seem to be uh, more on the naive uh, side. Um, this oxidative phosphorylation or signs of transcripts associated with this was not significantly enriched in the CD62 and negative ILC. So here indicating that these cells might have undergone some degree of, of differentiation. And that became even more clear when we looked at the XTAT signaling, uh, which was uh, clearly not uh, present in the CD62L positive ILCs. Uh, but um, also not different uh, from, from the reference population for these CD62L negative cells, so indicating that they might have undergone some uh, activation. So at this point, we already sort of hypothesized that the CD62L positive cells, they, they really look like the blood uh, equivalents and that they could be more naive-like, whereas the CD62L negative cells, they seem to have undergone some degree of differentiation but still are not as active as the mature populations, and we refer to these cells as quiescent-like cells. So we performed a number of experiments to solidify this uh, terminology, and the first thing that we did was to look at the proliferation of these cells and could quickly conclude that in, a, you know, in, in the terms of proliferation, these cells really are quiescent because we see very little Ki67 expression uh, in these cells as compared to NK cells, for example, where we can clearly detect uh, KI67. We also looked more uh, in a targeted way to the transcription factors and, and cytokines produced by these cells and could conclude that, uh, especially the CD62L positive uh, cells, they really lack uh, features of ILC3, so RORC, HR, IL22, etc., but also ILC1s with lack of TBX21 or TBET and interferon gamma. For the CD62L negative cells, we do see some signs of expression of ORC and AHR and, and IL-22, again indicating that these might be a sort of intermediate, an intermediate step between the more naive-like cells and, and mature uh, cells. So to understand that in a bit more, we turn to short-term cultures of these cells, and uh, 12-hour cultures, just to see you know, what can these cells actually produce. And that really fitted very well with the transcriptional data in the sense that the CD62L negative cells expressing 45RA, they really produce intermediate levels of IL-22. It's lower than for ILC3s, but it also tends to be a little bit higher than for these CD62L positive naive-like ILCs. We can also see that these, both of these cell populations, they really lack capacity to make much uh, interferon gamma or uh, IL-13, so they really aren't uh, ILC1s or ILC2s, at least when we assess them in these short-term cultures. So the next step for us was to really, you know, we can conclude that these cells are not uh, differentiated cells or mature cells, but can they uh, differentiate? And to assess this potential of these cells, we turn to epigenetic analysis. And this turned out to be really interesting because here we could see that these cells expressing 45RA, whether or not they express CD62L or not, they really were quite similar and they also cluster together in this uh, ataxic uh, hierarchical clustering. And they again turned out to be uh, different epigenetically also from the mature populations of, of ILCs. And more in-depth analysis using transcription factor motif analysis showed that these two cell types, so again here the columns in red and blue here, they lacked uh, motifs for binding of, of the ILC3 uh, master transcription factor for gamma T and GATA3, the master transcription factor for ILC2s, but instead they showed uh, enrichment of motif for binding of ETS and RUNT family of transcription factors, which we know is important for differentiation of, of NK cells. So, so these cells really seem to, to differ epigenetically from the mature cells. So the next step then, of course, became, you know, can these cells differentiate uh, to mature cells? So for this, we turn to OP9 DL1 culture, so OP9 stromal cells uh, expressing the notch ligand DL1, um, together with then cytokines that we know are important for differentiation of these uh, cells, IL-2, 7, 1 beta, and, and 23. And the first thing that we saw in these cultures was that, you know, yes, these cells seem to be in a quiescent state when we analyzed them ex vivo, 
But if we culture the cells, we can easily overcome this uh, quiescent state uh, in the sense that they start proliferating. So we can then clearly detect Ki67 expression in these cells, and we can also observe that they proliferate uh, numerically, of course. And this proliferation was uh, paralleled by an actual differentiation of the cells. So in these cultures, we could then suddenly, um, after seven days of cultures, detect uh, a lot of IL-22 production, which is then indicative of ILC3 function, uh, and also interferon gamma production, which then indicates that they have differentiated to ILC1s. And here are the, the summary plots to, to the right here. What was interesting though, and this is now data showing the from the from the CD62 negative cells from the tonsil, and the, the data was very similar for CD62 positive um, cells, I should add. But what was interesting from these tonsil cells was that we rarely detected uh, any IL13 production from these cells, indicating that they really struggle to differentiate to ILC2s, at least in this culture system. And this was very different from the blood equivalents that easily can um, then differentiate to IL-13 producing ILC2s. So here we seem to have really a difference when it comes to the differentiation potential of these cells, with the blood ones being more prone to differentiate to, to ILC2s. What, what what we were also interested in in these cultures was, of course, you know, are we really looking at differentiation here or are we more activating these cells to start making uh, these cytokines? So to address this, we zoomed in on, on transcription factors uh, known to be associated with the different lineages. And here is again the same data as I just showed you from the ex vivo isolated cells uh, with this particular uh, profile. But when we then culture the cells in type 3 promoting conditions with IL-23 and IL-1 beta, we can clearly see an upregulation of RORC and AHR expression in these cells. And of course, also then IL-22 and IL-17, which is upregulated. Um, and then conversely, if we culture the cells in IL-12 and IL-1 beta, we can um, readily de detect and um, TBET and, and interferon gamma expression in these cells. So it really seems that we're not just activating these cells through these cytokines, but they really seem to differentiate and start um, expressing these master transcription factors and the cytokines associated um, with those. So another thing that we were also really curious about um, in the differentiation of, of ILCs from these more immature precursors was the, the changes in metabolism occurring in these cells. So there are a few papers coming out and we're starting to really realize that metabolic uh, wiring is really associated with plasticity among uh, ILCs and that plasticity between ILC1s and 3s is to a large extent uh, associated with changes in uh, glycolysis and gly use of uh, glucose for, for energy. And differentiation of these cells, we had already in our transcriptional data seeing that that differentiation is associated with increases in glycolysis and, and transcripts associated with that and now we could confirm um, this by seeing that on the protein level we have an upregulation of GLUT1 and the glucose transporter both in the differentiation of ILC3 and, and ILC1s and this is shown in, in the summary graph to the to the right here with upregulation of GLUT1 during differentiation of these cells. And um, it also turned out that these cells, after differentiation, they really rely on glucose um, for uh, production of cytokines and effector function, because if we introduce um, a glucose transporter inhib inhibitor, so 2DG, we can um, quite clearly then see a dampening of IL-22 production from the ILC3 uh, differentiated cells, but also a dampening of from gamma production from cells differentiated under ILC1 promoting conditions. So clearly glycolysis is important uh, for, from these, uh, for these in vitro generated uh, mature ILC populations. So I'm gonna try to wrap the first part up here in a, in a summary. So what we have shown here then is that um, the cells in the, the ILC population in the human tonsil that express CD117 but that lack NKP44 is actually composed both of CD45RA negative ILC3s but also these cells expressing CD45RA uh, that lack features of uh, mature ILCs. 
and that CD62L distinguishes between two uh, populations of naive like CD45 RA positive ILCs in this, in this tissue. Um, CD62L positive ILCs, we refer to them as naive uh, like ILCs because they resemble the blood, the previously described blood ILCPs, but they also have a metabolism that reminds us a lot of naive T cells and that they lack the transcriptional and epigenetic signatures of mature ILCs. The cells that lack CD62L, uh, we refer to them rather as quiescent-like because we see that they are epigenetically similar to, but they are transcriptionally distinct from these CD62L positive naive-like ILCs. And that includes expression of some levels of JAK-STAT signaling molecules, but also metabolic pathways that are more similar to, to mature ILCs. And we see that both subsets, um, they are precursors of ILC1 and 3, but less so for ILC2. And we also see that differentiation is really associated with a rewiring of the metabolism of these cells into uh, glycolysis, which is also something that they depend on uh, for their effector functions. So having described these cells then in, a, in the human tonsil, we really were also interested in understanding the role for these cells in, in the gut. That's really what we are the most uh, interested in. So we went to the human gut and asked, you know, can we find these cells also in the human uh, gut mucosa? And we again used the same markers that, that we had used in the tonsil. Uh, gating out uh, ILC2 and also activated uh, ILC, so NKP44 and HLADR expressing cells, and then looked for CD45 RA expressing ILCs. And we definitely see these cells there. And what we also observe is that um, these cells lack CD62L, at least after isolation of, of these cells, they no longer express CD62L. They are again very different from the blood equivalents because they express CD69, so again indicating that they might to some extent be activated or more resident as compared to their blood uh, counterparts. And we see that CD45 RA is a good marker for less activated or mature cells because it's the most highly expressed on cells lacking NKP44 and HLADR. So this really seems to be a good marker for, for less uh, activated or mature subsets. We then looked sort of at the composition of these uh, ILC populations in the in the intestine during uh, IVD, so inflammation in the gut, and we could again uh, recap what's been shown before, namely that during inflammation you get a depletion of NKP44 positive ILC3s. Um, but what we now saw was that this is really paralleled by an accumulation of these CD45 RA positive cells lacking CD62L. We see that these cells really are not ILC3 because they express low levels of raw gamma T and we show the, you see the histograms here to the left and then the bar plots next to it where we see that uh, the, the 45RA expressing cells for so the blue ones here they show raw gamma T levels comparable to the negative control uh, the NK cells in, in purple to the far right here. We again see that these cells do not proliferate when we analyze them ex vivo, so they show uh, little to none uh, KR67 expression, which is very different from other ILC populations, such as the NK cells, where we see a lot of, of uh, proliferation. We also assessed the potential of these cells to differentiate, um, and we did this in clonal cultures, given the, the low cell numbers that we have uh, from these gut biopsies. And so we clone these cells in, in 14 to 15 day uh, cultures to assess what the capacity of these cells to differentiate is. And we saw that these cells um, can generate intron gamma producing ILC1s, uh, IL22 or IL17F producing ILC3s, but they can also generate cells that co produce IL22 and, IL and intron gamma. So it's also the multipotent uh, precursors of ILC1s and ILC3s. We could then see that this, this pattern of what the cells can become in the intestine is quite different from what we saw in the tonsil, because we also performed clonal analysis from the tonsil cells. And there in the tonsil, we really see that the majority of, of cells can generate uh, intron gamma producing ILC1s and, and few generate uh, IL22 producing ILC3, whereas in the, in the colon then, we see 
the a more a sort of higher frequency of cells generating IL-22 producing IL-C3s. And this becomes even more clear if we plot it like this, where we really see a lot more uh, IL-22 producing or IL-22 and IL-17F co-producing cells coming out from the inflamed IBD intestine relative to the tonsil. Um, these cells from both of these two tissues can definitely both still generate uh, ILC1. So in that in that way, they are relatively uh, similar, even if it seems to be a slightly higher capacity for the tonsil cells to, to generate ILC1s. So we can then add to this conclusion that CD62L negative quiescent like ILCs uh, with a preferential differentiation capacity towards IL22 producing ILC3s are accumulated in the inflamed colon of patients with uh, inflammatory bowel disease. So these cells are accumulated in the intestine during uh, inflammation, and there are several ways uh, how this could occur. So one way would be that these cells would be recruited from the blood. We know that inflammation in the gut is associated with a lot of influx of lymphocytes in the intestine. This is sort of one of the hallmarks uh, of, of inflammation in the gut. And this would then be according to the model that uh, Jim DeSantos group already proposed when they when they identify these ILC pre precursors circulating in the blood. And these cells would then be recruited into the gut tissue and, and lose CD62L expression and, and sort of generate this accumulated population of CD45 RA expressing um, cells. We also thought about the possibility that these cells might proliferate and thereby become accumulated, of course. We definitely don't see um, proliferation of these cells. They rather seem to be sort of proliferatively quiescent cells. So that doesn't seem to be uh, the case. We do, however, still think that these cells could be derived from ILC3s and that this would mean a sort of de-differentiation of the ILCs. This is something that has been previously described in a mouse model of psoriasis, where plasticity of ILC3s was associated with going through a stage of, of being sort of quiescent and upregulation of quiescence associated uh, transcripts. And that would then mean that the loss of ILC3s and accumulation of these quiescent like ILCs would be a, a sort of loss of mechanism, loss of function mechanism for IBD because these 45 RA positive cells uh, do not produce IL-22 and cannot contribute to the homeostatic control of these IL, uh, through IL-22 production. Now, we, we definitely uh, see that these cells, these quiescent-like cells, can generate IL-22 producing uh, ILC3s, uh, at least when we take these cells out uh, and assess them in vitro. But clearly, this is not enough in vivo to replenish the ILC3 pool because these ILC3s are uh, lower in frequency during inflammation. And that could be due to the fact that these 45 RA positive cells, of course, also has the capacity to generate ILC1s, which we know are accumulated during inflammation, um, also because of this plasticity between ILC3s and ILC1s and the effect of IL12 and IL18 mediating the differentiation of, of uh, ILC1s. Um, so we now have this sort of uh, novel population of of quiescent like ILCs in the intestine and which is then accumulated during inflammation and these cells really are targets for uh, treatment that is used to treat patients with IBD. One of these treatments uh, or biologics that target alpha 4 beta 7 the inter integrin uh, could really be affecting the recruitment of these cells because we know that circulating uh, naive ILCs express uh, alpha 4 beta 7. Uh, so that could be one way of targeting the recruitment of these cells if this is now the way that these cells get into the intestine. Um, we also know that um, biologics that target IL-12 and IL-23 would of course also heavily impact the uh, differentiation and plasticity of these cells in the intestine, as well as biologics that more selectively target IL-23, which would then sort of um, skew the balance of, of differentiation of these cells. Now, so the data that I've uh, showed you so far has all been derived from adult IBD patients. And these patients um, have often, when, they, when we receive the samples from these patients, they've often had their inflammation for a relatively long time. They have likely undergone rounds of immunosuppressive uh, therapy. 
So it's very difficult for us to understand the cause and consequence uh, here and whether or not these cells are accumulated early on during inflammation and could contribute to really the, the early phases of inflammation. So to assess this, we were also um, quite fortunate to collaborate with uh, pediatricians and IBD doctors uh, working with children. And we had the possibility then to obtain biopsies from children with IBD and could see that also in these newly diagnosed and treatment my pediatric IBD uh, samples, and these are patients that often then get their diagnosis much faster than adults do, we can see this accumulation of CD45RA positive ILCs, and the accumulation uh, or the frequency of these cells really correlates to both the endoscopic scores or the macroscopic assessment of inflammation in the gut of these children, but also the histological score, which is then a microscopic assessment of inflammation, which tells more about the cellular changes occurring in these, in these tissues. So the more inflammation you have in the intestine, the more uh, frequent are these CD45RA positive ILCs. And that was paralleled by other changes that we have seen previously in adult IBD tissues, namely uh, accumulation of ILC1, to some extent also ILC2, and a decrease of NKP44 positive ILC3s with increasing endoscopic and histological score in these samples. So we really have this broad uh, dysregulation of the ILC composition during inflammation in both adults and pediatric uh, patients with, with IBD with accumulation of ILC1 and 2 and these more recently described CD45RA positive ILCs and then this decrease in NKP44 positive ILC3s which really disturbs uh, the way that ILCs uh, typically contribute to homeostasis uh, in the gut. So now these data that I've shown you show, so far has really been you know, very focused on the role for ILCs in the intestine and of course we know that ILCs do not work in isolation and we know for example that t-cells have a really important role in driving inflammation uh, during ibd so one question that we've had for many years is you know what is the relative role of ilcs to relative to t-cells in the intestine and can we assess this in some sort of uh, global way so uh, we decided to to do this and we again turn to pediatric ibd patients for the reasons that i that i just mentioned that these Patients often have a more uh, a smaller diagnostic delay, so they've had their symptoms for a shorter time once they uh, go to the hospital. They are, in this case, they were newly diagnosed and they were treatment naive. And we then sampled the least and the most inflamed part of the intestine, so we could do paired analysis and comparisons between the two, two different sites. And then we isolated ILCs, NK cells, and T cells through uh, fact sorting, and then performed uh, single cell RNA sequencing to, to really unravel uh, the relations between ILCs and T cells. And the single cell RNA seq, illustrated here in a, in a U map, could of course then reveal the expected cell types. We had ILCs uh, clustering out, the NK cells also being a discrete cluster but also subsets of T cells, including naive and central memory T cells, effector subsets of CD4s and CD8s, but also um, resident memory CD4 and CD8 uh, clusters of cells. So what we were really interested in in these data was to really understand you know, what happens in the inflamed versus the, the less inflamed intestine and what is the sort of relative role of ILCs and T cells. So for this question, we made use of the fact that the biopsies represented um, a sort of a spectrum of inflammatory states uh, with samples with different histological scores. So we made use of Euclidean neighbor smoothing analysis to identify cells that were overrepresented in the most inflamed part of the intestine in a patient representative way. And these are cells that we refer to as most inflamed cells or cells that were overrepresented in the least inflamed intestine um, in a patient representative way. And these are cells that we then refer to as least inflamed cells to really look at the most sort of extremes and identify cells being more associated with inflammation or cells more uh, associated with homeostasis and, and uh, a healthy gut. So we started to look at the, the most inflamed um, cells and maybe quite unsurprisingly, we had accumulation of NK cells here, 
effector CD8 and CD4 positive T cells, as well as activated CD4 positive T cells and, and T regs. And we can't, in our data, distinguish between these activated CD4s and T regs, um, just to, to, to know that. Um, these cells were accumulated, but they also were unique in the sense that they showed a unique transcriptome as compared to the rest of the cells in each of these clusters. So for NK cells, we had this quite dramatic uh, upregulation of, of the cytotoxicity associated molecule uh, granulysin, but also the NK cell receptor PLEC2B. We had expression of uh, cell K and CREM associated with uh, signaling and activated CD8s. Um, expression of unconventional granzymes in the CD4s and several uh, transcripts associated with redox balance in the activated CD4s and Tregs. But what more caught our attention was the fact that when we looked at the cells that were more associated with having a healthy gut or more homeostatic condition, we had accumulation of ILCs and uh, tissue resident CD8 and CD4 positive T cells and naive and central memory T cells. Also, in this case, these sort of least inflamed cells were associated with having a, a, a specific transcriptome. But in this case, the genes expressed by these cells were shared between the ILCs and the tissue resident CD8 and CD4 memory T cells. And they were genes that we have previously seen in tissue resident T cells, such as NR4A2 encoding uh, and NOR77. Uh, transcript, but also JAN-D and ICOS, which we know is expressed by uh, tissue resident uh, T cells. And this uh, higher frequency of, of ILCs in the uh, less inflamed intestine or healthy intestine, we could also confirm uh, using our flow cytometric data, where we uh, absolutely see a higher frequency of ILCs in the non-IBD or non-inflamed intestine as compared to the inflamed intestine. And we saw a very similar thing for the you know, tissue resident uh, T cells using adult IBD tissue, where we see then higher frequencies of CD8s expressing CD69 or co-expressing CD69 and CD161 as compared to uh, patients uh, with IBD. Sorry, but they're drilling here. <laughs> Uh, so that's the data for the CD4, CD8s, and it was very similar to the CD4 positive uh, T cells using these markers. So we have these really uh, discrete differences between the inflamed and the non-inflamed intestine, with the inflamed intestine being more dominated by transcriptionally distinct populations of NK cells and effector CD4 and CD8 positive T cells. Whereas the less inflamed intestine or more healthy intestine is then dominated by ILCs, uh, tissue resident uh, memory T cells and naive and central memory T cells. And for the ILCs, um, we then see that the remaining ILC population in the intestine, even if this population that remains is sort of dominated by CD4 to 5 RA positive ILCs, and that we know that these cells have the capacity to differentiate to ILC3s, this really doesn't seem to be enough to replenish the ILC3 pool and to restore the dominance of ILC3s that we see in the healthy intestine and you know, being able to, to restore homeostasis in the gut through, through these uh, ILC3s. And why that is and what regulates this and what sort of dampens the capacity of these cells to, to replenish the ILC3 pool in the inflamed intestine is something that we are very interested in but still do not really understand uh, at this point. So I'm going to stop there and I, I hope that I've given you a sort of insight to the to the spectrum of ILCs and their relative role in the both the pediatric and the adult uh, IBD uh, intestine and really take the opportunity to thank uh, the people that have really done this work. So Ftimia uh, that I've already mentioned did uh, a lot of, of this work together with the rest of the people in my in my group, of course, it's a great team of people. Um, we have a really nice collaboration with our clinical uh, partners, uh, both for, for these uh, pediatric IBD patients, but as, as well as the, as, the, as the adult patients. So thank you very much. And um, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for fantastic uh, data. I really like the uh, data from the pediatric um, IBD uh, patient sample. So I have tons of questions, but I'm so sorry that we cannot get the question in the real time. So uh, 
let me close uh, today's talk and thank you very much again. So um, I, uh, I have one announcement how to make a question uh, to Jenny. Let me share one slide. So uh, if you have any question to Jenny, uh, please first search for the account Global Women Talks and find a tweet that says, ask question for Dr. Jenny Mosberg uh, here and uh, reply uh, to that Twitter with your questions uh, and please mention uh, Global Immune. So thank you for attending and uh, have a nice day.